Why are you telling me? Welcome. Welcome, everybody. What an exciting time to be back live from Inglehart Hall. So good. So good. It's been like 13 months or something, a long time. So I'm so happy that we're all here. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Nick Ferry. He has been with us all day, so he, he doesn't need exactly the same kind of introduction, but uh, today he'll be talking about how he likes to play games. Um, he is a native to the UK, has lived in Seattle for 25 years. He was educated as a rocket scientist and an aircraft designer. He graduated with a master's degree in aeronautical and astronaut astronautical engineering. Upon graduation, he joined a group of friends to form a software company specializing in electronic mapping and route planning. This company earned an unprecedented number of awards and accolades, including the British Design Award and the Queen's Award for Technology. Mr. Barry was recognized by the Sunday Times Magazine as one of the top 50 entrepreneurs of the decade. He has worked for Microsoft, Real Networks, and Facebook. Most recently, he was recognized as one of the 50 over 50 in the video games industry. This morning, Mr. Barry imparted the wisdom. One, try not to waste a day. Two, make memories to help those you leave behind. Three, forgive one another. Four, inspire others with your passion. Five, tell those that you love, uh, sorry, tell those that you love that you love them whenever you can. I watched as Mr. Barry taught students how to estimate the weight of a tree during an Earth Day activity today, gave the math team and computer science students the secrets to landing a job at Facebook, motivated the math department to hike across the Grand Canyon, and I expect to be inspired by Mr. Barry's passion again tonight. So I can say for sure that one, the day was not wasted. We made many memories. I thought about people to forgive, I'm still working on forgiving. <laughs> I was inspired and I will declare on behalf of our entire school, Mr. Nick Berry, you are a hero. We love you. Suitably far away, so I'm going to take my mask off. It makes it easy for the mic to work. Good evening, everybody. I'm going to start off with a couple of slides, give you a little bit of background about my uh, time as data scientist, and then we're going to walk into the meat of the presentation about uh, games. Off we go. So, let me tell you a little bit about who I am. My name is Nick, and I am a data scientist. This means, according to Harvard Business Review and Forbes magazine, I have the sexiest job of the 21st century. <laughs> but what does a data scientist do? Well, it's my job to collect the digital breadcrumbs that you leave behind as you navigate the internet forest. And I help make people better products and services. But I have a confession to make. I have no formal training in data science whatsoever. I've never even taken a stats class in my life. As mentioned earlier, I was educated as a rocket scientist and aircraft engineer. This was uh, my intern project. I worked on the display cockpit for the Eurofighter Typhoon. And my final year project at the university was to build this jet engine, which is built out of a diesel truck turbocharger. I'll tell you all about it if you're really interested. I'm very proud of it. Out of all the things I've done and built, this is the thing I'm most proud of. 12 weeks. Quick biography, as mentioned. I started a software company in 1988. I started Microsoft. Spent 14 years at Microsoft, uh, 10 of which were in the games team. Joined Real Next for a little while, I ran the analytics team for Real Networks. Then I started consulting, working for myself, so I had a fool for a boss. And then I worked for Facebook, and I spent uh, six years working at Facebook, and I retired from Facebook just before I got diagnosed with cancer. So, if I didn't study data science at school, how did I get involved in uh, data science and analytics? 
Well, a couple of things. The first thing, I read everything that this uh, author produced, Martin Gardner. He was a prolific uh, writer for Scientific American and various other books. Um, he turned thousands of children into mathematicians and thousands of mathematicians into children. I was one of those. I'm not sure whether I was a mathematician or a child, but he turned me into the other one. And I also grew up in the time of space invaders. Uh, I used to like video games. I used to write video games as a kid, and that's how I, I cut my teeth writing 6502 assembly language code. Then I joined Microsoft, and I joined the games team, uh, because, I'll let you into secret, the most popular Windows application of all time is uh, Solitaire. More hours have been invested in Solitaire than any other application that Microsoft has ever made. Um, put a computing device in front of somebody, they don't want to play games with it. And when I joined the games team, the first question I asked people on the games team is, what time of day do people play the most games? And they said, well, we don't know that, but how do we know that? Well, you've got this website that tracks all the people's information. Should we, should we be tracking this information, recording all this stuff? And they said, that's a bloody good idea. You should do that. And that's how I started. Um, I would track the number of people who were playing other games at different times of day and integrate them. And then I'd go to competitive sites, right? The web crawlers would go across the web and find out the number of people playing all these different games on different services and plot these things out. Here's kind of an example of what a population curve would look like over 24 hours. The answer is about 7.15 Pacific Standard Time is the peak about which most people play games. And about 2.15 in the morning is the quietest time. So if you're involved in the back end side of things, you want to decide the best time to uh, do your certain maintenance, about 2.15 in the morning, I can sort of tell you is the best time to minimize your people. So anyway, that out of the way, the main part of today's presentation is going to be a, a mathematical analysis of games. So I'm going to take a look at some classics of card and board games and show how you can use some basic mathematics to learn a little bit more about them. We've got a bit of background to get going, uh, and then we're going to get to the side of things. So don't panic. There's going to be a little bit of math, but not too much. We can sort of, we can sort of cope with things. So we're going to start. Let's play a game. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to roll the dice. Just one die. There it is. And if it turns out to be a one, or two, or a three, I'm going to give you a dollar. If it turns out to be a four, five, or a six, you're going to give me a dollar. So the question, the rhetorical question I'm going to ask the going tonight is, would you play this game? It seems a bit, a bit fair game. So let's change the rules a little bit. I'm going to take the three out. If it's a one or a two, you give me a dollar. If it's a three, four, five, or six, you give me a dollar. Would you play the game now? We would say yes, then we'll just stop the presentation, we'll just play this game, game all night. <laughs> so how do you decide whether it's a good game or not? Well, I'll upset half the audience with the Bayesian and the Frequentist, but there's two different ways of sort of finding out whether it's a good game or not. The first is you can just play the game over and over and over and over again, which will get richer and the poor will get poorer. Or you can build a formal model, you can build a mathematical model, you can sort of say, hey, two times out of six this happens, four times out of six it happens, and then build a, a, a mathematical model to decide it's a good game. So a um, little bit of sort of background as, uh, about these things. You've got the concept of something called the expected outcome, which just happens that if you happen to play the game over and over and over and over again, what would we expect the answer to be? And uh, we roll our dice, and so we can find out that um, you know, there's a one six there's a one six chance we get a one, a one six chance we get a two, one six chance we get a three, one six chance we get a four. We sum all these things up, and that's the expected outcome. And it gives an exact answer straight away, which is the green one. Or if we would do this sort of Monte Carlo way of just rolling and rolling and rolling and rolling, we'll get the drunken man's walk. It's eventually going to sort of settle onto the right thing. Uh, if the experiment was repeated a large number of times, what the result be? That's the concept of expected icon. We'll talk about that uh, later on in, in the presentation. So now, kind of a little bit of a contrived example. You don't really have to follow up, but just showing you how absurd this thing sort of goes. Now we're going to roll three dice. And if there are three odd numbers, we're going to re-roll the two lowest dice. If there are two odd numbers, we're going to just roll, re-roll the lowest dice. And then we'll sum them all up. And if the total's all odd, we're going to add the highest number again. And here's the, the, the payoff. If the total's over 17, I'm going to give you $7. Otherwise, you give me $3. And the question I got to ask you is, would you play this game? It's, it's kind of very complicated. And we can do a subjective approach where we can try and model it and say this, and die one, and die two, and die three, and all of a sudden it gets very, very complicated very, very quickly. And if we want an exact answer, yes, we could do it this way, but it's so hard. Or, as we did out before, we've got the concept of a Monte Carlo simulation. What we could do is we could just 
random, use some random number generators to play the game over and over and over again with lots of rolls of dice. And you know, um, yes, until you get to the casino. So that's what we're going to do in this particular game. And this is what what's happened with results. You can see the, the graph of all the uh, possible results that are coming out. And our answer was sub 17. So if it was 76% uh, of the time it lands here, and about 23% uh, of the chance it lands there, we lose $3 on this side, uh, we gain $7 there, and we do the expected sum, and it turns out to oh, it's put off the bottom. The answer should you play the game? No, probably not. You're going to lose about 66 cents. Then, out of the way, that's the silly examples. We're going to now look at some now real world examples. I grew up in England, so we call this snakes and ladders, but I do understand in America it's called shoots and ladders. It's, a, it, it, it's the same game. So let me ask you a question. How long does the game of uh, snakes and ladders last? Well, we can sort of try and find this out. We can uh, model these things, and what a mathematicians, computer science, I like to call a directed graph. I've got a, a board here which shows the 100 uh, states that you can sort of be at. And as you move on across the board, the state changes from being in position one to two to three to four to five to six. The little yellow arrows represent the ladders that you go over, and the, and the red spots represent the snakes and the shoots that you sort of go down. So, how long does the game last? Well, the shortest possible game is seven rolls. You can actually roll a four and go up here, and then you can roll a six, and another six, and a two, and then another six, and then a six, and four, -da, and you can do win. That's the shortest possible uh, way of solving the game. But how long does an average game take? And we'll talk about what I mean by average later on as well. So we can use our Monte Carlo simulation and say, hey, let's play a billion games, and you end up with a graph that looks like this. You can see it's impossible to finish the game in the seven uh, moves, and then it peaks up here, and then it sort of comes down from here. This is by playing, I think it's a billion games. Yeah, I played a billion games, so it goes through. So what can we find out about this particular graph? Well, we can find out the modal number of moves is 20. In terms of, if we play the game, the most, most likely number of moves it's going to take to finish the game is actually 20. But what else can we find out? Well, we can plot a cumulative chart, the number of games that finish in this number of moves or uh, n moves or less. And then we can find out things like mercifully that 97% uh, of the uh, games take 100 moves or less. And then we can sort of find the median number of moves, which is 29. And that moves us onto the sort of question what kind of average are you looking for? We have lots of different sort of kind of averages. There's something called a modal average, which sells at number 20. So the most common number of moves to complete the game is actually sort of 20 moves. We have a median average. The median here is 29. As many games take more than 29 moves as take less than 29 moves. So the average is a, is, a, is a median average. And of course, we have the arithmetic mean that we all know and love. I've played a billion games. I had to roll 36.2 billion dice in order to do them. So the average number of moves is 36. So when somebody tells you the average, what do you mean by average? And you can always sort of push back and sort of question. If we want an exact answer, we can use a new technique. Um, uh, this is something called uh, Markov chains. It's named after a famous uh, Russian mathematician, Andrei Andrei Markov. His dad was a mathematician too. And he said, hey, listen, you can model things as a sort of states, and things can only be one of those states, and you can work out the chances, the transition between those particular states. Uh, it talks about stochastic probability, which is you don't know what's going to happen, but something's going to happen. And as an example, let's say you're in state one. It doesn't matter what state one is, we'll talk about that later. But there's a chance you can move to state two, there's a chance you can move to state three, state four, and you work out what the probabilities are that you can transition between these states, and also there's a probability you'll stay exactly where you are. So with that in mind, let's apply that um, to the stochastic process to our shoots and ladders board. Let's say one square G, it doesn't matter what G is, one square G of the board, and we roll the dice. Only one of six things can possibly happen. We end up at square G plus one, G plus two, G plus three, and all of these have a probability of a one six chance of happening. It's stochastic, it adds up to one. Something has to happen from there. Crucial to this is now it's something called a memory system. I don't care, I'm agnostic. I don't care how you got to square G. As long as you're on square G, tell me what happens on the next roll of the dice. Oh, I'm pushing the wrong button. It doesn't matter how we get there, the probability is to move on to other things. And all the problem is that up to 1.0. Something must happen on the next roll of the dice. So how do we apply this to our shoots and matters board? Well, we create something called the matrix. Um, we model the board in a series of states. So what I'm saying the state of the board is whatever square you want, you're on square i. And you want to get to square j. 
So you put in the matrix a probability that the chance that you would move from square state i to square state j, and you fill the matrix of these probabilities. And again, we'll, we'll show some examples of these things. So here's an example of a shoots and ladders board with no shoots and ladders on board. Let's say square g is square 11. There's a 1 6 chance we'll end up in square 12. 1 6 chance we'll end up in square 13. 1 6 chance. So again, everything on this row adds up to 1.0. You know, we know something's going to happen. And it's this leading diagonal something that goes by. That's our basic vanilla board for shoots and ladders. Now, we're going to start to have these states and ladders on the board and see how it adjusts things. When you have a snake on here, you never land on square 20, you slide down here. When you have a ladder, you never land on 23 that goes through. So let's see how this would change a matrix. Again, let's imagine this is square 18. There is a 1 6 chance I land on square 19, which is here, which is good. 1 6 chance, oh no, we don't land in here, we come down to 9. So we've got the 1 6 here because we end up at state 9. 21 and 22 are exactly where we expect them. There's no 23, we can't land on 23, but 24 takes it all the way up to sort of 28. So now we've put our shoots and ladders on the board. We've modified our matrix, we've got this transition matrix that tells us what the transitions are. Couple of gotchas. There's two things we have to watch out for. The first is some squares you can get to in more than one way. As an example on here, square 50. If I roll a one, two, or a three, I'll get to square 53. If I have to roll a six, I'll go one, two, three, four, five, six. Ooh, I'll slide back down again. So there's actually a two in six chance I'll end up on square 53 when I roll the dice. Still, everything on the row adds up to 1.0 because stochastically something has to happen. It has to be one of those particular states. That's watch out number one. Watch out number two. This is uh, mixed uh, house rules that some go through. But when we play at home, or we used to play, you don't need an exact one to finish. You could just sort of go back to the end. So you have this absorbing state on there. Um, so, example, if you're on square, uh, uh, oops, excuse me, square 97. You can roll one, two, or three, or four, or five, or six to get there. So you can find that problem to sort of change again. But still, everything on the row adds up to 1.0. So we've now created our transition matrix. We're halfway there. And what we do is uh, we put all those probabilities into this giant matrix, sort of 100 by 100 matrix on the screen. And then we create a column vector uh, off to one side, which says, well, we start at square zero, state zero, or we draw for now. Starting state, everyone starts off off the board, we multiply by the matrix, and we get on this column vector on the far end what the probability would be of all these different squares. So let's look at the example. We've got our matrix, we roll it one time, and this is what we come out with on the first roll of the dice. Here I'm using this um, color coding scheme the darker the blob, the higher the probability that goes out. And you can see when we roll the dice, this is what's happened. There's no way we can land the square one, we end up on the ladder that goes through two, three, uh, five and six more likely than four that goes over here. And that's, on the first roll of the dice, what's the probability we end up with these squares? And these are the only states that we could end up at. But this is the entire beauty of mark of analysis that goes through. Wash, rinse, repeat. What we do is, once we put our starting state in, we take the ending state, we feed it back into the matrix again and say, hey, if I start at all these new positions, and multiply them by, what's the probability would be on the second row of the dice, this is a superposition of all the other places we start. We get some interesting. So this is roll one. On roll two, we end up something like this, where we started all those other places, and now worked out the probability there, what we multiply by the matrix where we end up. And you can see it's shaded a little bit different, the darker shades. You're more likely to go these squares, which happens to be closer to seven, uh, but there's a chance you can to land on, on these other squares. Then we've got, I think, row three, row four, row five, row six, we've got to row seven. And when we get to row seven, it's pretty hard to see the shade, but we've got, we've got our first non zero probability, which confirms what we saw before, but you can get a non zero chance of solving in seven moves. It happens about sort of, uh, two times every thousand. And row eight, and if we get down to five, we get down to row 20 or 100. There's a very high concentration because pretty much all the sort of games are finished there. And I think if this works okay, I have a video of this. And what I'm going to do, you'll see it just tick over, we'll move every sort of couple of seconds. We'll see this probability cloud uh, move up the map. If this works, three, two, one, there we go. Roll two, three, four, five, six. You can see this cloud gradually moving up the map. And, it, and you'll see it get darker and darker and darker and darker and darker and darker and darker. And darker, and darker, and darker. It gets a bit boring, so I can, I can skip that if you want. So um, this is the graph that we get from the Markov chain analysis. And look, if we compare it to the one we got from Monte Carlo, 
it looked exactly the same, or very, very, very close. So there's a formal model and a subjective model, but um, we said we, we compare them all and sort of zoom in, uh, and zoom in a little bit further, if I can think, if it goes through. Within the torrents of the random number generator, we, ma we match perfect well. So that's, we've shown that the, the, the Markov chain is a, is a really sort of good way of doing things. It's always good when you do it two different ways and you exact, get exactly the same answer. It, it, it's fact. There are a couple of takeaways. When you use Markov, there are other things that you can do. You can count, for instance, the number of times the ladders are used, the number of times the snakes are used. So on average, game, which are the most popularly used ladders, which are the most popularly used snakes? And you find out you know, other things like ladder number one, you can only use ladder number one if you happen to roll a one on the very first time. You can never go back to that which shows you've got a 16% of the chance of that happening. And here's a puzzle for you. You can add extra snakes to the board, and it decreases the average number of moves to the game. How could that possibly be? Because snakes are never sitting backwards. How can you possibly add extra snakes to the board? I think, so. I think so. somebody knows the answer. Those long ladders are hyperspace bypasses. If you get a long ladder, it shoots you at the board. If you miss the ladder the first time, you've missed an opportunity. If there's a snake that takes you back to get your second crack or a third crack of that, then there's a, a, a other opportunity to take that sort of ladder up in life. So that's sort of uh, how you can actually do all of these things. Um, that's the second chance. A little bit of history. Um, Shoots and ladders is one of the oldest board games. Um, and it was uh, invented by Hindu spiritual leaders to teach children about the rewards of good deeds. So snakes represent vice and poor choices in life, and that ladders represent stand virtue and morality. And actually, the square hole when they were doing the ball was actually divine, and you got up to the top of the ball. So there's a lot of history in, in, in shoot to that. <laughs> Candyland. Has anybody got younger kid siblings that had to sort of suffer from Candyland? <laughs> so, it's not a good you, there are no decisions you make in the game for seven years. But um, let me ask you again, yeah, how long does the game of Candyland last? Well, uh oh, this is not a mentalist system. Because in Candyland, if you're familiar, there's 64 cards, you shuffle the cards, and then you deal the cards out. Once you've dealt the cards out, the probability of uh, the cards left in the deck is different. It's based on uh, understanding. It's why. Um, if you're familiar with uh, blackjack and card counters, the cards that sort of come out of the deck modifies the probability of the cards left in the deck will be tens or other small cards. But we can have a go at one thing, we can do something called a crippled Markov chain. And what I've done for this is the idea of you've got 64 cards, just shuffle the deck, you take a card out and act on it, then put the card back in the deck and just shuffle it again and draw the card again. So it's not quite the same thing, but it's much easier to model. Um, so again, the same thing, we create a direct graph with all the possible sort of connections on there. And you create a matrix, you work out what the probabilities of landing all these little squares. You, you can uh, model that. Uh, there are bridges in there which you can use hyperspace bypasses and sticky squares which delays you. You can model a lot of the Markov chain pretty well. Um, here's kind of an example of uh, on the first move. These are the probabilities of being certain squares. I don't know what you can see on the model. Here's the candy cane and the, uh, the gun belt. There's a one in 64 chance. Even on the first card, you're going to get those, those particular things. And the second move, and the third move, and the fourth move. Again, I think I have a video of this cloud. There we go. You can see the cloud moving around the map. And each, as each card is played, here's the probability you'll be there. And you'll see you know, very quickly, you can sort of get to the end. Um, when I compare the graph of the Monte Carlo against the cripple mark of change, they don't match as well. Uh, and again, you can sort of see why around the cripple, the 64 cards in there. When you're playing the crippled Markov chain, you could be lucky and draw out all the cards and never hit that magic ice drop or go with the gun drop or the candy cane that's sort of central back. But when you play in real life, once you've gone to the deck, you're bound to have seen that card, that sort of thing. Things. And so because of that, depending on the number of players in the game as well, the probability you're going to finish at different times changes as well because you're more likely to have evaporated the deck. And also with Kanban, it's first past the post. If you were the, the first person who finishes, it gets to finish. So again, depending on the number of players, that can adjust things. I'm not sure anybody all to be in here to play to the Texas Hall of Poker, but uh, if you did play Texas Hall of Poker, um, you could ask yourself, what is the best thing hand in Texas Hall of Poker? Well, it can depend, because poker odds are very complex. There's a mixture of cards that you need what we call suited cards, uh, cards on the same, uh, all the same suit. But sometimes you want modal cards, you want the same ordinal ranking of the cards. Uh, sometimes you want sort of a, a mixture of both. And things change. Depending on the number of people playing the game, 
the odds change. Um, if we're playing a head to head with somebody and there's a gut shot straight that shows up on the table, which is a straight that's just missing one card, the probability that one of us has the card to complete the straight is very low. If there's 10 people at the table, somebody's bound to have the card that's going to complete the straight. So the average hand to win increases uh, the necessary to in order to win. So the value of your possible starting hand does actually change. And it's a superposition of all these odds. It's the chance of you making the flushes and the chance of you making straights. Because certain cards you want to collect are, will help you in some things, but are uh, hurt you in others. And so the odds change. It's a uh, number of combinations, I think, in X, it's at school, but I've got 52 cards in the first one, 51, 49, so it's pretty large when there are two players. By the time you get to 10 players, it's just massively immense. You're never going to be able to sort of work things out. So we have to use a, a Monte Carlo simulation. This is what computers are very good at. And this is what we end up with, with, with something a little bit like this. There are 169 possible starting hands at poker. We have pocket aces all the way down to sort of pocket twos. Everything the upper triangle part of the matrix here, these are what's called uh, suited cards. These are the ones that are the same suit. Uh, these are unsuited cards. So we have uh, queens, uh, queen jack suited, queen dead suited, and ace jack, ace jack unsuited. Uh, for the probability guys here, anything that's shaded in color is a positive expected value, which means if you stay in against an automaton or wasted in every hand, if you only ever stayed in with a hand that's shaded in a color, overall along the route, you're going to run out. If you notice, it's very symmetrical down the leading diagonal. There's not much difference between having a suited card and an unsuited card. By the time you get to uh, 10 players at the table, things have changed quite dramatically. If we look at this, you'll see there's a huge shift over onto the suited side of things. And even things like an you know, ace, nine, ace, ten, one suited card are actually particularly poor hands. And you look at this, you think, why are things in here like jack, seven, and suited? That seems crazy. And you think, well, no. 7, 8, 9, 10, Jack. These are loosely connected cards. They're cards that you could possibly make a straight on if, if the cards sort of came out of the game. So they're much more valuable when there's a lot of people at the table. And if they all stay in to the pot, you want the chances of, of, of making a bigger hand. Risk. Anybody play Risk? It's a, it's, a, it's a sort of fun game. But for those who are familiar with the rules, uh, a tactic can roll up to three dice. The defender can roll the two dice. The highest dice is going to get the highest dice, and then the tie defender wins. So, is it better being an attacker or a defender? Is it better that the highest dice wins or, uh, or the defender wins? Well, let's bother. Let, 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 let's try and find out. And sometimes, you know, brute force is kind of the, the easy way. There's a bit of pseudo code here, but there's only a um, number of combinations. There's only 7,706 possible combinations. We just do this best to do this thing. How can you win and not win? And this is what we come up with. We come up with uh, all these possible uh, major scenes that to go through. But this is attacker rolls three, defender rolls two, attacker rolls three, defender rolls one. And you work out the percentage chance you're going to win two attackers, defender wins, and this goes through. So here are possible sort of combinations. But of course, risk isn't played just under one round, it's coming through as a series of rounds. So we end up with um, something a little bit like this. And we say, well, we've got an attacker attacking with seven, a defender that goes with five. What happens? We could build this tree. We've already known the basic calculations that we've got here. We know on a three versus two, the attacker wins uh, two, this percentage, the defender wins two, that goes through. If I, if I take that back again. From here, we know work out, well, this is where the defender loses two, this is where they lose one each, and this is where it goes by. And we fold the tree all the way down, it's recursive all the way down. But if you can get a job on Facebook, something from recursion is a very bad way of doing things. It said this is a dynamic programming model, there's, there's, there's optimized ways of doing it. But if you do that, um, you end up with a Nash type, and here's the probabilities you'll sort of get through there. But you like the color, so it's a shade all the colors. And this is the chance uh, where the red, red is shaded with the attacker's advantage, blue with the uh, defender's advantage. And if we walk through here, we see after five on five, the advantage goes to the attacker, whereas before it was the advantage to the defender. So we can learn things from this. Uh, we like to talk about 95% confidence levels as data scientists. So there's a, if you want to make sure 95% confidence you're going to win a battle, these are the, the color shaded squares that you do. But strategy, it's better to attack than defend, so you, you want to win at risk, you, 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 you be aggressive. Um, the second tip, it's kind of obvious, always attack with superior numbers to maximize the chance of us attacking successful. That's kind of obvious. Um, but if attacking a region with the same number of armies as a defender, make sure you have at least five armies if you want the ultimate in your favor. This is kind of really important. Yahtzee, anyone play Yahtzee? Yeah. Yay! A bit of animation there. So, what's the probability of running Yahtzee? You know? Well, how do we find it out? Well, in one rule, it's pretty easy. 
Whatever the first dice happens to be, there's a one in six chance this is the next, one in six chance, one in six chance, one in six chance that it goes through. So there's a one in 1,296 chance on the first roll that you're going to roll the RTA, just a natural RTA, how it goes. But that's not the way the game works, of course, because you can bank and roll things. So again, we can use our wonderful tool, the Markov chain, this of goes through. Here the states represent the number of matching dice you've got. So if we've got five matching die, there's a 100% chance of ending with five matching die at the end of the roll. If you, got, if you roll four of matching, if you've got four of matching die, there's a one in six chance you're going to make, you're going to make the one that's going to take five, but there's a five in six chance you're going to stay exactly where you are. If you've got three of a kind, there's a one in 36 chance you get both of them, there's a 25 in 36 chance uh, you're going to miss them both, and then through, through subtraction you can sort of work out the probability of this goes through. Watch out, I see this on the internet, and people on the internet get this wrong. There's one thing you have to be really careful of, it's these two figures here. Because imagine what happens. You roll your five dice, you've got a pair of sixes in garbage. So what do you do? You bank your pair of sixes. Then you roll the three dice again. What happens if you get three fives? Well, you're going to switch your target to the three fives and dump the sixes. So your probability here of transitioning from uh, two to three also has to include the probability that you get another number that's not the number you want, and you also get three of a kind of that, and you can switch over. So these two have to be sort of sorted out. Once you have that matrix, again, you can start with a column vector of 1.0, and you roll it once, and you multiply it by matrix once, twice, three times, and you can get the answer. Um, uh, the answer is actually 4.6% when you do the math. So the chance of uh, getting a uh, yards in the three rolls is 4.6% chance. But because we use Markov chain, there's lots of other what ifs and kind of things we can just get for free. Like if I ask, Danny, Danny, can I have one more roll? Can I have one more roll? You can work out what the cumulative chance of getting the answer if you can have more rolls. And you can sort of find out by the time you get to, oh, I'm excuse me, you find the time you get to uh, seven or eight rolls, you get about a 50% chance. And again, if you look at that column bit, it tells you what percentage of everything is entered in those particular states. So you can sort of find out what the probability will end up with four of a kind or three of a kind or plotting in another way, individual problems occur to something goes through. Here's the chance of getting four of a kind, and you find out. The chance of getting a singleton with nothing on three rolls, just not even getting a pair, is just incredibly, incredibly small. Next. Hangman! <laughs> this is the new section. I, I, I haven't put this in before, so I hope the slides go so go okay. So if you play the game of Hangman, and so let's put the, 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 the blanks for you. What letter do you guess first? Oh, got some good answers. Let, 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 let's investigate. So let's just say that I've got a dictionary, and that my dictionary contains 170,000 words. And it's a, a, a very thick Oxford dictionary. And I'm going to choose a word at random from that 170,000 uh, words. And you have to guess the letter that you think is most likely to be in the word somewhere. The rules of uh, Hangman are one or many times. It doesn't matter how to go through. So yes, when you're a young kid, the first thing you do is, well, just guess that's a random. And that's an okay strategy, but it's not very good. So then you say, well, I'm going to guess vowels first, because it's kind of all while wow, wow words contain vowels, apart from trist and nerd and crypt and some other things, but we're all wise about it. Well, we'll that. But um, then you think, well, you know, I've learned a little bit more about the English language. You know what? I'm going to base letters based on frequency, because not all letters are equal. So you do a Google search and say, hey, what are the most popular letters in the English language? And sure enough, Google will tell you uh, this is the uh, frequency distribution of letters in the English language. It's uh, e grouped in bunches of five for no other reason. Five, 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 five. But E T A O A S. These are letters. So you know what? I'm going to guess E first. I'm going to guess T A O. But is that right? Because not so fast. That's the distribution of letters in the English language based on taking a huge amount of prose. ETA, whatever, that sort of goes through. This is a distribution based on the figures of all use of the English language. So, what Google has done is taken New York Times and shape, works of Shakespeare and put all those things in there. English is full of words that are used very frequently, such as the, of, and, to, in, and these bias a distribution. I'll let you know. But a third of all printed English languages make up the top 25 words, and the, the top 100 words make up approximately half of all the printed English. So we're overcounting all the words of the, to, and of, which are adjusted to frequency. So that's not the right thing to do. This is not the right distribution of letters because we're guessing the word, a single word at random. 
What we want to do is build a frequency distribution based on the words in the dictionary. So imagine I've got the dictionary, I've got the first word of the dictionary and say, does it contain an A, yes or no? Does it contain a B, yes or no? Does it contain a C, yes or no? And build my frequency usage based on the words put in those letters, not based on them biased by the letters. And also with Hangout, what you find out is that if you get a letter, it doesn't matter whether it's one or many letters, you get a hit from those things. So if I'm counting purely the number of letters, I'm going to double count the word gossip um, instead. So what I should be doing is having this Boolean thing saying, does this letter, word contain this letter, yes or no? And if it does, I score it one point. So what you find is you get this. This is the distribution of, uh, of letters in the English language based on the idea of how many, if I count in all the words, I got a point for every time E occurred in a word, it'll be here, here, and then S, so it goes through. And this is how it compares to the distribution of letters we talked about since the movie. You find that even the vowels have shifted around. Look at S, S has gone from here, from here to here. S is much more popular in an individual word as it goes through. But what else do we know? Well, we know about the length of the word because we know the number of dashes. So rather than going through the entire dictionary counting all the frequency distribution, if we know it's a seven-letter word, I should only count the letters that occur in a seven-letter word. So I know my length of the word. So I can cross out all four other words, five other words, eight other words. All I'm doing is doing that frequency count saying, hey, which of these words contain this particular letter? Now tell me the distribution. What we end up with something like this, which is fascinating here. I, I, I love this diagram. I'll spend a little bit of time. This is the uh, number of letters in the word, and this is the ordinal frequency of how many of those things. That's what happens. This is arbitrary. There are only two letter words in the English language, A, A, and I, that sort of goes through. We can find out the most popular letter here. Look at this. In fact, I've got some sort of trivia takeaways on uh, there's a seven letter word that sort of goes through. There are only two letters, two words that have one letter. There are no two letter words that contain the letter C, Q, V, or Z. I'll see you guys. Um, for one to four letter words, which are these ones sort of, uh, here, um, the most common letter is A. So if you get A, that's the most likely you're going to get a hit. For five letter words, it changes to S. If you see five letter words, the first letter you should guess is S. For six to 12, it's E. By the time you get to sort of 30 letter words, I is the most popular vowel. Who knew? So you should guess I first, even though it's in the most popular vowel. Look, well, it's a trivia. There's no 18 letter word in the dictionary containing the letter of J. If you ask it, go to the And there's no 20 word letter in the dictionary containing the letter W, it doesn't exist, which is why there's a little sort of gaps in here. So we're getting pretty close. We think that we know if it's a seven letter word, here's the letter frequency that we sort of choose. So, every penny's a good one until the first shot is fired. So, Here's our letter distribution. So, so it's a seven letter word. I said, hey, Nick, is there a letter E in this word? And I say, no, there's no letter E in the word. What letter do I guess next? It's not S. Because there's a cross correlation. Words that contain E's also possibly contain, some, to contain S. So what I have to do is remove all the words that I know don't contain letter E, and then re the analysis a second time. So here's an example of lots of words. Once I know a word that contains an E, I can strike all those words out of the dictionary, and then I redo whatever's left, do the, the, uh, the, the uh, frequency analysis on those particular letters. And so here's the word that sort of goes through. And this is what you end up with. You end up with, this is the best strategy for sort of playing hangman that sort of goes through. First of all, you know uh, what the letter word is. You say, hey, I will choose a letter E first. If there's no letter E, I'm going to choose letter A and it's going to go through. And what you can sort of find out is that, you know, again, if the word gets longer, I is the best vowel to sort of guess when it sort of goes on and uh, sort of find out. So, minimum here, uh, and you can find out the S of the first of the words to sort of guess this video board. So, now you know the, the perfect strategy for sort of, uh, for sort of playing hangman. After the first letter's out, it, it's changed because you have the code filter. Once you know where those letters are, you choose a different strategy. So this is just to, to maximize your chance of getting the letter on the board to, to, to filter things down. Darts. Anybody play darts? Okay, so where's the best place to aim on a dart? Triple 20. Well, yes, no. It depends on how good you are. <laughs> now, if you're good at darts and you hit the triple 20, you're going to get 60 points. Good for you. But if you miss, hang on a minute, there's a 5 over here and a 1 over here. So you're going to get a really bad score if you miss a 20, and you get a really bad score this time. The design of the dartboard on this time was sort of going on. 
maybe there's a better place in the dartboard that you can aim towards that's going to, if you miss your target, you're going to still kind of get an okay score. So how do we sort of uh, find that out? I mean, there's an example of a picture here. Here's a dartboard, and it's here kind of this sort of uh, blob about where you, you, you can possibly, as your blob gets bigger and bigger and bigger, you see it incorporates some less high scoring area. So maybe there is a better place maybe somewhere on the dartboard you can aim towards, but if you miss what you're targeting, you still get a, an okay score. So how do we model that? Uh, we, we can um, model things, oh, we've talked about something called standard deviation, which is the average deviation from the average. And good players are very predictable. They have a very, very precise sort of target. So we have this little witch's hat. Um, we put the area under the curve, it's a cylindrical distribution, but the area under the curve to 1.0, so you know it's gonna be happening here. So tight players are pretty good, whereas not so good players, they have this flatter sort of distribution area as it goes by. And what we can do is we can apply that to, to a dartboard. Now, this looks like a, a Gaussian bloom if you played with Photoshop. This is exactly what it is. It, it, it's, a, it's a Gaussian bloom, and it just shows how um, we've used colors to represent the areas you, 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 could, uh, you could target towards. Here, um, you'll see the standard deviation over here in the top corner. This is 17 millimeters for 2K. It tells you what your maximum possible score is or, uh, uh, from this area. And, and the magenta reticule um, tells you where you should aim to maximize your chances if you think you have a standard deviation of 17. There's very few ways you can work out for a standard deviation. What if you just aim at the bullseye lots of times and throw lots of darts and look at the scatter plot? There's ways you can sort of reverse it and work out what your standard deviation is, and this and that will tell you where to sort of hit, uh, where to aim towards. And I think I have another animation of this. What this animation is going to do is every second it's going to tick over, and the standard deviation which is in the top corner is going to start off with. Perfect throw where they aim. It's going to go to one, and two, and three, and four. And you're going to see this probability cloud move over uh, areas of the map. So let's see if it works. Um, yes, you can see at the moment the magenta reticule is still sort of here, aiming here. And at some point, you're going to see jump to somewhere down here. There it goes. And then it's gradually going to curve its way around. In fact, it's going to put the bullseye. Because if you're really bad at dark, even hitting the board, you're going to get some sort of score. So just aim at the board, just throw the dark. Hitting the board is, is, is better than nothing. So this is where it happens to be. And we can learn a few things from this uh, as well. Here's a, here's a map showing you what a plot uh, would look like. Um, pictures take a thousand words because it goes through. So here's a really skilled player. This is the where we use the z-axis to represent what the uh, expected score would have to be. And this is a very skilled player. You can see it's very, very sharp edges. Here's kind of a medium player, which is what the cloud goes by. And again, here's the good really crack player, this is what we've sort of gone through. When you plot it, um, you find out that uh, we can learn from darts, but you can have a skill elbow. So again, some piece of advice. Darts is one of those games, if you play, uh, if there's asymmetry of the players, the player who's good is just to wipe the floor with you. It's like playing a game of squash. If somebody's really good at squash, you sit down, let's play a game of squash, bang, two, bang, two. It's nothing at all. Whereas a game like golf, um, there's a handicap system where somebody who's really good at golf and somebody who's not so good at golf can both go into the golf course and have a challenging time and sort of hit the ball around because the handicap system, they can both have a fair game and the, the better player based on the, the handicap system is going to work. So darts is not a game to play unless you're playing with somebody who's the same sort of skill level as you. And we talked about before just hitting the ball, there's actually a second skill level uh, for darts. This is just the, Probably you probably need to hit the board at all. So if you can't hit the board, your scores go, so go, go, go down very much. So uh, we're coming to the end of, uh, end of the talk. I give this Patrick. If you like the kind of things that I've talked about here, quick plug for my blog. Uh, as I mentioned, I've got 450, 460 articles where I talk about you know, strategic things and battleships and sort of. Uh, I had to get the most amount of ice cream in a, in a cone for you know, the spring spheres and sort of that kind of stuff. How to solve uh, difficult problems, Shamir's algorithm, lots of stuff. So I, I, there's a whole sort of depth of knowledge or sort of things that sort of go by. And with that, I think I've uh, got to the end of this evening's presentation. Thanks for listening. I think we've got sort of uh, plenty of time for sort of questions, and I will quite happily answer questions until it's time for everybody to go. So uh, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. I don't know if you can.
Uh, Mr. Meyer is going to go around and take any questions. My glasses on, I guess. You are a little bit Um, hello. Hello. <laughs> um, so I'm a big Wheel of Fortune player. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm wondering if like the hangman kind of like strategy also works for that game too, since it's phrases instead of just one word. It does. And uh, I, I should read out my blog. There's plenty of articles about sort of Wheel of Fortune. And also, um, the price is right as well. That's fascinating. But if you ever see the big wheel, when you spin the big wheel and you get a kind of thing, should you spin the wheel again or not? It depends whether the person's going first or whether they're going second. Because if they're second, they've got nothing to lose, you might not do But is there a lot of stopping to the point? And uh, I go through the math and those things. So if you like that kind of stuff, I think I have two or three articles on Wheel of Fortune and uh, a couple on, uh, on the price is right as well. So uh, please do sort of do that. Yes, all these strategies can, can be used. Uh, Almost things, yes. Thank you. Hi, I wanted to ask, what's your favorite game to play? <laughs> um, I like card games. Uh, and I've, I finally got around to sort of teaching my kids how to play hearts and spades. And uh, it's hard when, when there's just sort of two kids, but when we sort of go around to other people's house, oh, Dad, can we, can we play hearts? And uh, it's fun. Teaching them the different strategies that go through in terms of, you know, learn to count the number of hearts that have been played, learn to count the number of spades, so you know, when you've got the master spades that go through. It's interesting to see their progression as they've learned the, 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 the subject. And it's a great game, like a beginner's game, to get into the bridge. So I love playing some of, uh, some of card games. Um, board games are so fun as well. Um, what I really like, uh, I can play Settlers of Catan, which is, um, what I love about Settlers of Catan is it's fun for everybody. If you play you know, Monopoly, which is a uh, random, whoever's wrote gaming, turning into Monopoly, gets all the attention. Everyone else gets bored by watching TV because there's nothing going on. But every role of Santa like a you have skin in the game for every role because something good to happen against you. And it's so amazingly well balanced in terms of uh, uh, goes through. Uh, Klaus Troy, I think, was the German guy. He's, um, it's, I think it's like one in every two households in Germany has a, 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 a set of in their house. It's just the really perfect board game. So I, I like that game as well, just because it is so well balanced. I, I, I love that as a classic game. Great question, thank you. There's a question uh, coming in from an anonymous uh, person here. So how would you say someone should get started or involved now at our age they are interested in joining a technological business one day. Um, this question has come up a lot, uh, and so I will repeat the answer that everybody has today. Do things using your passion outside of your curricular work. Um, if you go to college and study computer science at university, everyone's going to do the same courses, everyone's going to do the project work, then you go to university, you can present the stuff. And the person interviewing you or recruiting you will have seen this two or three hundred times and everybody's been to your sort of school. But if you've written a game in your spare time, or you've helped your mother set up the website for a PTA association, or you've created a little sort of web game, or you've built a directory of CDs at home and a little sort of database, that shows you use passion and your interest in the subject outside of the work you're required to do at school. And that's going to sort of pay dividends for you when you walk and say, hey, this is something that I've done that shows my, my passion and enthusiasm for it. Um, so that, that's one thing. The second thing is there is no shortcut to learning uh, skill with juggling, playing the piano, riding a horse, it goes through other than practice. So doing what seems like trivial, simple things. I'm writing a program that solves uh, this particular puzzle or generates perfect solutions to Pythagorean triangles and all those things. Every time you write code, you learn something and you get experience of familiarity with it. We talk about um, going, like learning another language. You go from conscious competence to unconscious competence. What do you do without thinking? It's just easy to build those things. And that's something there's no experience to sort of unlearn time to do it. So, do work on your own on your own time. Practice things uh, and try and create something for other people outside of your extracurricular work is the best advice I can give you. Uh, my question is just, what's your favorite kind of poker to play, both in terms of probability and enjoyment, and also, can you count cards? 
I've tried counting cards uh, and I'm not amazingly good at it. I don't think I'm, I'm quite as fast. Um, I like playing Texas Hold'em poker because, again, it's a. I'm not a big gambler. I, 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 I don't go to Vegas. I've never played poker in, uh, in Vegas ever. I've played a slot machine. I've played a blackjack tables just a couple of times. I use the basic strategy. I don't count cards, but I know the probability of what's going to go. But poker is a very social game that I play with my some friends. And, uh, I'm a British guy, it's surprising, but we, there's a, a few of the British people in, in Seattle, we all get together and have a poker evening, which rather than beer and pizza, as Amer Americans do, we have cups of tea and sit around the table and, and we play poker. Uh, and it's a, it's a very, very social thing, we chit chat about stuff, about things that we, we miss about England and this go through, and that's the game that we've always played. So, Texas Holland Poker, again, because you've got draw poker, you've got to poker, um, there is Information is visible on, on, on the community cards as it goes through, and because of that, there's a little bit more strategy in reading the other person than there is when you just got a, a, a set of cards. So I, I think it's probably one of the purest forms of poker, um, and for that reason. So yes, I, I like to play Texas Hold'em. That's the whole my game of choice when I play. But I'm not a big gambler, but I have fun doing it. Um, and I, I play online every now and then just for, for fun, not for money. Thank you. Hi, did you always know that you wanted to be a data scientist? No. <laughs> when I was growing up, I wanted to be a uh, uh, fighter pilot. Now I realized I was a bit too tall, I wasn't going to fit in the cockpit. I hope six foot, you can't do that. And then um, I wanted to be an aircraft crash investigator. All I wanted to do, uh, if a plane crashes, it's a very morbid thing, if a plane crashes somewhere in the world, somebody wants to figure out what, what went wrong or want to stop these things happening again. And they have these, uh, in the UK, it's the AI, means the aircraft investigation branch. And they have this sort of team, crash team of people. When something goes down, they send these people out there and they dig in the fields and they dig out the bits of the cockpit to find out what's going on. And it's just friends, it's, it's like Quincy, if you're, if you're growing up. What went wrong? And all these science about things, they're like, in the early days, they had things like incandescent bulbs on the dashboard, which would get hot. So when, they, when the bulb was on, if the plane crashed and the bulb was on, the filament distorted in a different way than if the, bulb, the, bulb, the filament was cold. So they were like, what's the stall warning light on when this and the plane crashed? And then they dropped pieces of metal to find out they had electronic drug coefficients. I thought, this was staggering. I want to solve problems. I want to sort of uh, do, 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 do the show of homes and find out if the plane crashed and stop these plane crashes happening again. So I did everything I possibly could. I did my aeronautics degree, and I, uh, I would say I cyberstopped. But I found the man in charge of the accident investigation branch. I think it was Clive at the time. And I kind of found a way, and I knocked on his door and said, hey, I want your job. You know, how do I get your job? And he said, son, you've done everything right. You've done all your classes, you've done all the extra work that so goes by. But he says, take a look around you. And there's a place called Fred's Shed, where it's in the UK. It's on an RA farm run. And behind it, there's about 20, 30 engineers that are working there. And he says, look around you. And he says, if a plane crashes in England tomorrow, and we're called out, somebody on my team will have flown it, maintained it, painted it, changed it, changed something on it, helped design it, all that stuff. So here's my advice to you. You should go out into industry. Go out into industry for 10 years. I don't care what you do, but go out to the air for 10 years, get vocational experience on working on a plane and some factor. Then come and knock on my door again, ask for a job, and I'll give you a job. So that's great. I, I, I'd love to do that. So um, I didn't do that. Um, I ended up joining my group of friends who started software coming in a little back. But I did 10 years to the day, the guy was actually having to come to Seattle, go to Boring Field, and go through. He said, You don't remember me, but 10 years ago, you were said, You've come to ask for a job, haven't you? I said, No, I haven't. I've just come to some time and complete the story, but I'm not interested in the job anymore. But thanks for keeping it open for me. So, no, I didn't. I didn't know I was going to be a data scientist. Um, and like I said, I have no formal training at all. I've never even taken a stats class in my life. Um, so people keep coming to me for advice, saying, well, should I still do this thing at school, sort of thing? It wasn't even there. I was the first guy uh, in the company who had the title data scientist because it was such a new title. So, well, we'll give you a name. They called me an analyst before. Uh, there was a project manager before. If Microsoft didn't have a subtitle for it. It's such a new and upcoming science. And even now it's changing, uh, it's splitting up. It's not just a data scientist, machine learning, it's AI people, and then they want to sort of fabric uh, their uh, 
data analysts, there are data pipeline people, there are some proper scientists who go through. So it's a very immature term, it's a, it's a catch all. Yes, what's a very sexy term a few years ago? Uh, it's, I think machine learning is a new sexy term that's a bit of people in the uh, what are new AI is No, I had no idea. Um, and we had some conversations about it earlier today. Would I have changed anything in my life? No, I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't have changed things. The, the, my path I had to get through his career was a series of random events that have got me from one place to another place. And, uh, I, I was just very lucky. Wouldn't change a thing. I hadn't planned it that way. I know it's not really good advice, but you know, I, I, I didn't plan anything that way. Also, I wanted to ask, what's your favorite kind of tea? Ooh, yeah. I like an, uh, a blended English breakfast tea, uh, so a, 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 just a, a regular sort of black tea, um, and that, that will be fine. Not this fancy fruit fruit Earl Grey stuff or the oolong. So, uh, it's just regular blended English breakfast tea. If you and if you're a tea connoisseur, I go to Yorkshire, so I've actually been called the Yorkshire tea, which has been specifically designed for Yorkshire water, so a little bit harder. And I grew up on that, and I can taste the difference. So Amazon lovely supplies uh, Yorkshire tea, and that's what I get in, in the large container loads. So Yorkshire tea is the best tea. Uh, hello. Um, I first just want to say thank you so much for being here and um, talking, because it's really inspirational just to hear you talk. Um, my uh, question is, what do you think is the most uh, versatile or useful tool to have in the STEM in industry right now, do you think? Truly, Like uh, the most useful skill to have just working in the STEM Curiosity and common sense. I know the, 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 the two answers. Um, I'm an old guy, you can probably tell the time I don't know, I don't know much hair anymore. When I grew up, we didn't have calculators. I, I did my math test with, uh, I, I was the first year when I did my exams, we didn't have to use slide rules. I was told that my dad told me a slide rule, log tables, if anyone remembers log tables to go through. And when you use things like slide rules and log tables, you have to think, because it's this exponent of mantissa. You, you kind of need to know the right power of 10 you're dealing with. Am I expecting the answer to be 1.6 or 16 or 160 or 160,000? What power of 10? So you kind of expect to you know what the answer is, and it's plus or minus before you sort of slide it to go through, because that's important. You have to know the decimal place, not the point. So many kids today, because they use calculators, they miss out this common sense. It's like this, 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 and the, the fat thing, the tight thing. So they come and ask, oh, it's 150 million tons. It can't be 150 million tons. That just, just doesn't make sense. Yet they'll verbatim they repeat be things because the company has told those things. So whenever I, ever I write a piece of code or anything, it's of, before I hit execute, I hit run or things, I have in my mind what I think the answer is going to be to an order of magnitude. Uh, I'm expecting like when it's the, the, the hangman thing, how many answers am I going to get? What is it going to be? And occasionally I'm surprised that I'm wrong and the code is proved that the code is right. You can't argue with data. But most of the time, I'm, I'm, I'm there with no order of a factor of 10. And kids are missing out of common sense and, 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 and it's surprising. My dad told me the story once, he's getting a little bit off track, but you work for a, an engineering company. And he was sitting there, and some guy was sitting there at the window, and I think it was at ICI, one of the chemical companies. Uh, and the boss was there, and he was looking out the window, and this 38 ton truck sort of came by uh, with, a, with a generator on it. And the second truck came by with a generator stuck in the middle of the, the flat there, and the third one sort of came back. And he called all the engineers into his office. He said, I'm mad. Ask me why I'm mad. He said, Why are you mad, sir? He said, Well, I just watched these three trucks go by, each just containing one generator. And I know from the manifest that they're all going to the same place. Can anybody here explain to me why we're wasting all this money? Why Whose job is on the line? Can anybody tell me why we're sending three separate trucks in this place? One of the lender was having to, sir, each of these things weighs 38 tons. If we put more than one of them on the, on the thing, it would have broken the back of the, the truck. But he just didn't understand the, 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 the concept of, of those things. So common sense and understanding about those things. Um, curiosity is the other thing, the idea of, you know, if you just take the answer and that's why this, why this, why this? Um, and it's usually a, a feature of my blog, if you, if you read a lot of stuff, I'll tend to pose a question like, here's a question, what do you think the answer is? What does your gut tell you? And then I, I, I always, sort of, it's almost like a paradox. No, that's not the answer. Surprise, surprise. There really is an answer that's different from that. Let me show you what I, that, what, why the thinking even I've led down the path is what the answer is going to be. And that surprise inspires the curiosity. You know what? What happens if I put three dice in there? What happens if I put four dice in there? And it inspires them to go through. So that, that curiosity uh, will help with coding as well. The idea of you know you, you write the code, 
Coding is a very, like, you're not working on a nuclear power station. Coding is a very safe way to do things. Yeah, I put numbers. Why don't you have to put a really big number in? Why don't you put a really small number in there? And you can control it. You're not going to break anything. The company may crash if you sort of out stack space, but that's the worst that can happen. Um, so it gives you that chance to do what if, what if, what if, what if sort of kind of stuff. And that, that passion, that enthusiasm is, is what's going to carry you forward. So common sense and enthusiasm, I guess, we'll, we'll, we'll take you a long way. Yeah. Uh, so there's a question here about um, the application of some of the mathematical thinking you did to um, to music. Um, and so can some of the mathematical graphs you've designed for probability be applied to things like chart topping hits based on the key or the beat or the genre? So I think the question is sort of like, can you use those as inputs and predict uh, which is the best song? Yeah, many, many years ago, I, I, I can't remember the exact, we, we can look at the one they said, Yahoo did the same sort of thing. They, what they tried to do was, um, they took lots of indie bands and uh, they rang them and they said, can we predict things that's sort of going, going forward? And it's a sad thing to say is, um, they randomized them all, and they randomized them all, they randomized them all, and then suppose they preceded the ones to say, hey, this is a really good band, this is a really good band, and people are sheep. Um, the rich get richer, the poor get poorer, and it finds out if you totally randomize things, it's just totally random. If you precede by putting, say, oh, this is a really good band, and then on top of it goes on, that band tends to go through. Let's say with charts, you have no idea who's going to be a popular song, but a local radio plays that song, you get stuff in your mind, you have an earworm that tends to go by, and human made minds tend to sort of follow the crowd, and like to things, you sing the song, you end up buying it. So, for that way, you know, uh, we're very cynical about it, you, you probably can't do very much. As regards music, um, there's some fascinating uh, programmatically generated music. Uh, Microsoft bought a company many years ago um, that did the same sort of thing where music is quite large to score sequences of music. If you're playing a game, if you have various inputs, so you think of music as a function, you can say one parameter is the pace, one of the, is whether it's dramatic, one of which is scary, one of which is things. And it programmatically generates the music based on sort of this neural sort of sound, this pseudo randomly generated background. Then you walk into a room and it's a little dark. They can change the parameters of the music programmatically. The music changes to have, have the ambience of what's sort of going on. Or you're running faster and the beat of the music changes to a faster pace as well. And that, I think that's a, a great use of technology to programmatically generate uh, the music from that now. So a good use of technology. I guess when you were talking about the hangman, I thought that you don't usually have like an Oxford dictionary on your left hand or somewhere like to look which like which words have like seven letters, for example. Mm -hmm. And so is there a way of like mathematical modeling for like, I don't know, person's vocabulary or something? That is a great question. Um... The, 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 there's an easy way to answer it, and there's actually sort of uh, a real way to answer it. There's this concept of mathematics sort of uh, about something called the Nash equilibrium, which are related to sort of explosion formation. One of the things which I didn't talk about today, uh, battleships, is that I think I played the game of battleships, you put the battleships on there. It's a totally random, you can place your battleships anywhere. Now, if you always play with somebody who places their battleships towards the edge, and you've played them in the past, then you know full well that what you can do is, I'm going to guess the edge space, that's just how someone's placed on the edge. So you can get an advantage. But if they know that you know that, then they're going to not place it there to try and trick you. But if they know that you know that you know that you know that, and so you reach this point where you're this thing called the Nash equilibrium again, even if you knew any additional information about it, you're not going to help uh, get a better solution for what's going to go forward. And it's the same with rock, paper, scissors, and sort of other sort of games that sort of happens. So at a very fundamental level, you, uh, I, all my analysis was based on the idea of all the information was disclosed, and you could have, you could have chosen that because I, had I known that you were going to choose a common word that's in your common vocabulary, then I would have gave that. And you're going to trick me by choosing a really obscure word in the dictionary, and I would be, I'd be out of luck because you tricked me into those things. So I've got to see that you hadn't done that. In terms of uh, real life, yes, you can find some commonly used words. Um, something I actually have a pattern for, uh, of, of all things, and I was with Microsoft. If you ever sign up for a, um, a service like Xbox Online, you, you, you get your screen name. All screen names have to be unique to the stop attached. There's only one princess scene and the one on the squeaky bar that's on the, on the service. So all the common names are already taken. When you were trying to log on, it wouldn't be Princess Cena. Like everyone's taken Princess Cena or Lucy or Susie's already been taken. 
So you want to sort of come up with a random integrated end. If you come with random integrated end, it looks several. So I had very simple tables of adjectives and nouns, and it randomly maps them together. So it's kind of a well. You are going to be um, square fish, or you're going to be this. And in order to create this list of words, we want to use words that are in common vernacular, easy to pronounce, and sort of gone through. So yes, uh, I did curate a list of all the words, and then find out uh, you can find my kids' first dictionary, uh, the little sort of kiddie ones that only have, you know, 20, 30 words on there, and find those words that are easy to pronounce, and make sure you populate the list with those things, and those are the names that you suggest to people. So yes, there are things, but you just fall, potentially fall foul. If the word that, that, that you think is common is not in a common list, then you're suddenly out in, in, in outer space again, and then you've got all the structures that you use. So the only structure you can do is assume that any word can be used, and then you reach this national equilibrium on the side of things. But yeah, I think it's a great question. Um, certainly, you know, how, you know, how would you do it in French or German or Greek? All you do is you get know, a Greek dictionary and then put letters in there and it's all going on. Nobody ever used that word. Well, I didn't know it was in the dictionary. And you could have chosen it. When you work at Microsoft and on Facebook, what are some things you did as a data scientist? I did a lot. Uh, my time at Facebook, a lot of time on the data science team was spent on um, on games. Um, people play a lot of games online. No surprise. Uh, a lot of people play, play Farmville, Candy Crush, and all that sort of kind of stuff. And when they do, they make microtransaction payments where uh, they spend money. Not everybody spends money, but some people spend money. And what I was doing was uh, analyzing. The games that people play, where they spend the money, and cross correlations between the time that they spent playing different games and where they spent the money. So I could help the games publishers who made those games make better use of the time of the advertising and how they would sort of uh, push things through. So um, that's one of the, 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 the big things I did at, uh, at Facebook. Um, I looked into the messaging analysis to find out uh, different countries where people, early on in the days, uh, when Facebook first started, the messenger app used to send messages back and forth. It wasn't necessarily to your phone. If you send a message, you would go to your phone or go to your desktop and find out how many people successfully received the messages in, in, in different locations. Um, those are the uh, things I ended up doing. Um, when I was at Microsoft, a lot of the work that I was doing was based on um, analysis uh, that looks down on games and spending patterns where we would have a website, um, and we would have uh, flash or sliding block games on the website. And uh, the website, the candy, the drag game, the game, we on the website, we put banner adverts on the side, and we wanted to find out the games that people play, and then we would try and cross sell them to other games. And I would find out, um, like serology, people play this game, also play this game, people play this game, also play this game. So I would find out you bought these games, and there's a game that you're missing, that lots of other people like the game, also bought the game. We could we do a target email shop and say, hey, Lucy, here's a game that you haven't bought, here's a special offer and it incentivize you to sort of buy this particular game when you bought the ones in the series and analyzing those things was that kind of stuff that I wanted to do. Um, tracking population figures at different times of the day as well. Um, you saw those sort of curves. There is a server somewhere, hopefully still at Microsoft, that uh, every five minutes tells you the population of every game that they produce in uh, this call that we sort of go through. So I could see when Super Bowl came along, Population in some games would go down and some games would go up because you know people who have affinity to watch the Super Bowl on TV stop playing their games, whereas the old spouse, I'm not going to the gender, who doesn't want to watch the Super Bowl, or then use that time to go online and sort of uh, play games. So I can find out all well, the people who play this game also don't sort of play that game. When I left Microsoft before I joined Facebook, uh, I started my own consulting company, Data Genetics, which is where I belong under the day, but it's a consulting company. There, I was looking with um, keywords. Um, as we mentioned before, advertising is a big thing. Advertising works, it drives people up. So you can buy keyword advertising. Anybody, anybody types in a keyword like um, poker, you can detect it in, in Google, somebody's type that code. And so you could, you could put the banner for, for poker on one side. So certain keywords become very expensive, they become very valuable. If you want to buy keywords for poker because people sell online uh, poker games, they're very expensive. So maybe there's a way that you can target the same people by doing some demographic analysis on those people without using the word poker. There is a strong correlation of people who play poker also smoke cigars, play golf, or like speedboats, for instance. 
And those keywords are cheaper to buy. So it may not be 100%, but if I can get 97% of the same audience by buying the cigar keyword or my program over there, I can advertise and poke people. Now I can spend $2 CPM, I can spend 36 cents CPM, that's cost a thousand, uh, that's what goes through. So that's a much more efficient way. So I was selling my services and the idea that I will help you analyze the data to find out all the things that you could sort of find out about stuff. And it's fascinating. Uh, one of the things I did was, um, I looked at um, names. I, 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 I don't know what your names are, but my name is Nicholas. Today, it's trendy to call your kids by uh, Riley or Trevor or the one name. Nobody calls their kid Ethel anymore. Nobody calls their kid uh, Bert or George. Those are all names. So just by knowing somebody's name, you can build up a demographic profile with a probability of how old they happen to be based on purely on their name. And I was using that to, again, to sort of help me provide better services that sort of gone through just by having a list of names. There are some transgender names. Uh, Pat could be a boy's gay name or, or a girl's name. It's an androgynous name that sort of goes through. But all names are not. So again, if you give me a database of all your customers, I can tell you whether they're more likely male or more likely female or, and how old they happen to be. Just purely, even though all they have is an email name, and, and, and a customer name, and that kind of stuff can sort of help you more efficiently spend the marketing spend that you want to sort of spend, and that's the kind of stuff that I did as well. It's just doing all these things. Um, there's a fun thing um, again, I advertise the blog. I analyze the White House visitors list once, uh, and, and I find out the names of uh, all the people, and you find out there's some peaks of. Uh, I don't know, it must be a thing when people reach 40 years old, they want to go to the White House for uh, to, to, to visit the White House, and then there's this little sort of peak when people get 40 years old. A right of passage they want to go visit. Or in Christmas, you find out people want to visit the um, um, more likely females visit the White House on Christmas. I think they want to see the Christmas decorations they've got And you, you just find out different public records of, uh, of things in there. It's fascinating to find out. We could probably talk all night, and I'm worried about the time. Maybe we have time for one or two more questions. I will happily answer uh, the questions. And, and then, if anyone wants to stay on after, when we when the, the night's falling over, come forward. And until I've answered the last question, I will stay here all night until the last question. There's no problem. Yeah, I wanted to know, um, how often do you use, like, do you ever use these kind of math strategies when you're playing games in your real life? Like, you know, for example, if you're playing Hangman, would you guess E first if it was a seven letter word or whatever? It's horses for courses, it depends who you're playing against. Uh, if you're playing with a little sort of kid, no, that's brutal, that's horrible, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's an easy thing to do. If you're playing with your best friend and you've known for 30 years and you want to show that you're smart and he is, then yes, of course you would. Um, the best thing is to use them as teaching moments. I mentioned earlier, I'm teaching my kids how to play hearts well, not just how to play hearts. I'm just look at that. Why the heck did you put a club down? You can tell it's got no clubs if you're, you're in front of the way. Count the cards for, for, for all the whole things holy. And then, you can, you can use that as a, as a, as a teaching moment. So um, yes, I do use those strategies, but uh, what I'm doing now is, is using it to try and sort of educate my kids. And again, I get a positive answer. I don't have a, lot, a long time in this world, so I'm trying to sort of teach my kids things that are useful. It's not just saying, man, I just bought my son a new car because uh, he's spoiled and I want to get a new car before I pass. Don't ask me why, all the things we've got through. But I'm going to spend it on the Using this as a teaching opportunity. This is what's going to happen. We're going to go in there. The, the car salesman is going to tell you this. Okay, this is the pitch of salt. Here's the invoice price. Here's the MSRP. Here's the dealer's whole bar margin. Here's what they're going to try and sell about the undercoat. Here's what's going to go through. So anytime you can use anything that you come across life as a teaching moment, especially when there's math involved that you can use, how to, how to there's going to be trading, it's going to involve people to pay ball, it's going to try and do this, it's to draw this little square, and you can ignore it when it says this. Um, so, so yes, um, I, I, I do know those things, but again, it's for teaching rather than for anything else, and, and that's what I'm trying to do. Right? I'm trying to sort of pass it on. Since the uh, people here have a chance to come up at the end, maybe I'll just ask one more from here, and then uh, mm -hmm. we'll have the invitation to go up. Um, so, if you could leave us with three words, what would they be and why? Passion, 
I know maybe it's come up before, but I, passion and enthusiasm. Now, I know that some, some of the thesaurus held the album, but it was swash those words together. Something that you sort of care about deeply, that enough that motivates you to sort of do more of it, uh, would, be, would be the thing. Um, honesty, again, what we talked about on the outside, in a reflective way. Start off, trust is one of those things that if you give trust to somebody, they tend to reflect it back. If you, uh, it's a hard thing to do, but you know, sharing something quite open early on helps you with things. So I said, be honest and genuine with some people to start off with, and then reflect back what they do to you. If they're honest back to you, continue to do the same thing back and forth. And it's just virtuous cycle, it's a build that builds and builds and grows. Um, a third way, I think, uh, word, uh, it's not really a word, but I never talk about it again. I find out, don't waste things. Um, the time is precious, emotions are precious, the ones you take are precious. It's not really a word, but I, I, I understand that you, you can't, you, there's no time machine to, sort of, to go back. So, uh, <laughs> Carpe diem. Season that do do things in, in that way. So uh, I really I, I, I'm with that question, but uh, those are the, the principles, and they're not big words. But that's what they have to be. Well, you, you gave us the why, so you have to say more than three. It's great. So.